Today is Transfiguration Sunday, and that's why there is white on the altar, and uh, usually we'd be talking about that, but, um, well, Missouri weather did a number on a lot of things, including my preaching schedule, so I've got to finish up with Timothy, and we'll, we'll get to Transfiguration maybe next year. We like to say what people like to hear. This is not any shocking news. It's something we're all fairly used to. It is true from the way we are tempted to say the merest of white lies. Yeah, that tastes great. To uh, telling people what they want to hear, maybe not what they need to hear. This is true not just today, but across all the ages. If we look across human history, uh, we think about the history we know here, here in America. Are, are you familiar with the phrase, yes men? And people who will tell you yes no matter what. Yeah, that's a great idea. Is it a good idea or not? They're just going to tell you, yeah, that sounds great. Right? Yes, men. That's what we're, what we're talking about, right? People, they, we are tempted to surround ourselves with people who will tell us, yes, you're wonderful. That's a great idea. And, and it takes uh, an, an intentional act to cultivate, uh, to praise people when they, when, when someone tells us what we need to hear, might not be what we want to hear. We have to like praise them and encourage encourage them and thank them for doing so, or it won't happen, right? And so in the history of Israel, there is a particular flavor of yes men that show up, and they are called the court prophets. Uh, this shows up mostly in the books of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. And so uh, what was happening was the king, it, is, it was just known, the king, if the king goes astray from doing God's will, doing what God wants, the whole nation is going to follow and there's going to be problems. And so the king needed to be first amongst all people paying attention to what God desires. And so a prophet is someone who says, thus saith the Lord, this is what God wants, this is God's opinion. And so... At the beginning of the monarchy, we had King David, and he has a, a friend, uh, Nathan, who is his court prophet. And he's the one who will look at David and say, that's not right. That is, or at times he says that is right, but we, we have the record, record of both. I mean, Nathan is the one who looks at David uh, after David, the whole David and Bathsheba thing happens. And, and so for a time, the court prophet was a, a place of honor. That It was the person closest to the king that was pointing the king towards God. <laughs> But then that faded, and that failed, and then the court prophet began, began, uh, began to be the, the yes men of that kingdom. The, the people would say, yes king, you really should invade. Yes king, God will, God will make sure you always win. Yes king, you have Jerusalem, God will never let anything happen to Jerusalem. They become the, the yes men of the Old Testament. And so the, the people you can trust to tell the truth are the people like Amos and Jeremiah and Isaiah, the prophets who, who, who show up and say what is hard for people to hear, but it is necessary to be heard. But the prophet Isaiah, Amos shows up and says, yes, this is, it looks like a great uh, day economically, but the, the poor are ground, being ground beneath the feet of the rich. This is not good. And all the while the court prophets are saying, king? Things are looking great. Your economy is doing wonderful. Amos is the one who shows up and says, no, your economy is destroying people. Like Jeremiah is the prophet who shows up. And when all the court prophets are, are telling the king, everything's great, wonderful, everything is great, right? It's Jeremiah who shows up and says, your kingdom is, is walking away from God. If, if something doesn't change, your kingdom is going to go into exile. Babylon will come. Right? And so the, the prophet is the person who can be trusted to tell the truth, whether you want to hear, hear it or not. The prophet is the one who, who says the bad news that you need to hear, so that then you can hear the good news that God will get you through, but you got to hear the bad news first, the hard news, right? Last week we finished up 1 Timothy, and so this week we're going to move on to 2 Timothy, and the word court prophet never actually shows up in 2 Timothy, but I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this today, because it is what both Paul and Timothy would have known all about in their history, and it helps me understand what uh, Paul is warning Timothy about. And so, last week we wrapped up 1 Timothy, and when, as we wrapped up 1 Timothy, 
It was this letter to a young Timothy who wants to hit the road again and keep on traveling with Paul and has been at Ephesus just long enough to know what the problems are and he thinks he's got a handle on it, but he's ready to move on. And so 1 Timothy is the letter to Timothy saying, buckle down, get your leadership all on the same page. Get focused together as a church on being a good thing for the community. Right? That, that's what you need to do, Timothy. You've got to buckle down. Second Timothy, even though it's just a page later, what happens between the last page of 1 Timothy and the, the first page of 2 Timothy is, is, well, a lot. Almost a decade. In that period of time, Paul has gone from traveling to now Paul is imprisoned. He's stuck. Right? He, he, is, he, he is stuck, and he has been captured in the persecutions of the Emperor Nero, and, and that's not going to go well for him. We believe that that is when he dies in Rome, is in the persecutions of Nero. And so this is one of the last letters that Paul writes. And, and so this is a, a, a lot has changed here, right? Timothy has done what Paul directed him. He has stayed at Ephesus. He has buckled down. The church is still there, and uh, that's impressive. You, to start a church and have it still be there a decade later that's not a given like a lot of churches fail in that first decade so timothy has done amazing work and, and so paul writes him and, and let, let's listen to this this letter with that in mind that this is uh this has gone from a young timothy to now a middle-aged timothy who has settled in and is doing this work right? so if the letter begins with some opening greetings then uh, paul says god did not give us a spirit of cowardice God gave us a spirit of power, of love, of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed then of this testimony about Jesus or about me being prisoner because of that. But join with me in being willing to suffer for the gospel. Right? From the beginning, there is this sense that Paul is encouraging Timothy to be bold, right? To join me in suffering if that's what comes for it, but, but be bold in, in doing this. Paul continues, My child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's an interesting turn of phrase, to be strong in grace. To be rooted in this idea of grace. Grace is this, you are forgiven. Grace is a gift. Grace is everything that's done for you by God that you do not earn. To be strong in grace is to be rooted in the sense that like, we're sinners and everything comes by grace. Right? The forgiveness comes by grace. So never let go of that central asset, that central tenet of the Christian faith. Right? Be strong in grace. Lean on that. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses, then entrust to faithful people who will be able to teach as well. You got to keep on growing your leadership. What you know, you are strong in grace. You got to keep on bringing other people into that so that they can be strong in grace as well. And trust what you're doing to other faithful people so that you share in the suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Yes, you might suffer, but do not suffer alone. Have people walking with you who are, le who are all strong in grace together. Have nothing to do with stupid and senseless controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kindly to everyone, an apt teacher and patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. And, and so Paul has started out by saying, be bold, right? A spirit of power and love and self-discipline, but handle it in a way that does not cause controversy. Do not be quarrelsome. Correct people, but do it gently. Right? Don't cause the church to be at odds with each other. Be graceful about this. You must understand that in these last days, distressing times will come. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, arrogant, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, implacable, slanderers, brutes, treacherous, swollen with conceit. They will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to an outward form of godliness but denying its power. An outward form of godliness, that would, I think of that as how we say, you know, they're good people, right? They're just good people, right? Well, sometimes we can put on an outward form of, of godliness, 
but deny its power. Right? For among the, them are those who make their households and captivate, make their way into households and captivate silly folk who are then overwhelmed by their sins and swayed by all kinds of desires. People who are always being instructed and can never arrange at a knowledge of the truth. This is as close as Paul gets to saying you can't fix stupid. Right? This is it. People who are always being instructed and never arrive at knowledge of the truth. Right? There are people who are stubbornly not going to learn. People who are stubbornly focused on themselves. Avoid them as Paul's direction. You can't change people who are not going to be willing to listen. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. You have watched what happened in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. And so having talked about how there are people who will make their life hard, Timothy, right? Paul then points out, you know, we, you know the stories. You know what happened in all of these places. You know what happened in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. You know the time that I had to be lowered outside the back of the city, down a wall in a basket to get away from people who were trying to mob me. You know, Timothy, about that time when the silversmiths of the city started a riot because they thought that the, the, the news about Jesus was going to impact their silver sails of their little silver idols like uh, the silversmiths really did run Paul out of the city like you know how odd and weird and awkward this can be to be a servant of Jesus and you also know that God got me through all of this and God will get you through it as well but as for you continue in what you have learned and firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through christ in jesus knowing then that all scripture is inspired by god and useful for teaching for reproof and correction and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to god might be proficient and equipped for good work You've probably heard this, this uh, verse before. All the scripture is useful for teaching and equipping people. When Paul writes this, what is the scripture? What's the Bible? This is written in the late 60s AD. The Bible is the Old Testament. Like, there isn't a New Testament yet. It'll be another 150 years before the bishops of the church will sit down and say, we should really figure out what this new thing is called. Well, we'll call it a New Testament. There should be four Gospels, right? It's a good century off before that happens. And so when Paul says that all Scripture is inspired in God and useful, like, this is not saying... It's an interesting thing, because we've already... If we read, you read Romans... Paul talks about how God came for the Jews first and then for the Gentiles. Like, if you read how Paul understands that what God is doing over time, there's this sense that God, Paul understands that God works in one way at the beginning, and then sends the prophets, and then sends Jesus, who brings the fullness of truth, and that God's it's, the Scripture is the unfolding story of how God is working. And so for him to say all of Scripture is inspired and useful for teaching is not to say, that you need to grab one single verse here and one single verse there and sort of build something. It is, just, it is My understanding of it is that this is Paul's reminder to Timothy that you are part of the people who follow God. Because that's what Scripture is. Scripture is the story of people who follow God. You are part of that story now. All of Scripture is part, part of that story, and you need to be part of it so that you are equipped for every good work. These are your tools, right? In the presence, and then it, he wraps up, and this is like the final charge. This is, this may be the start of the last words of Paul to Timothy, right? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, I urge you to proclaim the message, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, encourage with the utmost patience. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from the listening to the truth, and they will wander away to their destruction. 
Like this is the final charge of Paul to Timothy. As God, is there the sense of this, as God is my witness, you are to go forth and to teach, to convince, to rebuke, whether it's the right time to do it or not. It is never the wrong time to be able to tell people about the, the good news of, of Jesus. Right? You have to do this consistently, convicting, convincing, encouraging people. For people are going to be drawn, they're going to listen to something. We're going to, people are going to listen to something, and the way he puts it is, people have itching ears, they want to listen to something, and they will gather for themselves whatever suits their fancy, whatever condones what they already want. Because what do we want to hear? We want to hear someone tell us, you're great, just keep on doing what you're already doing, right? And, and so this is Paul encouraging Timothy, you've got to get to people and make sure they hear the good news of Jesus, not what tickles their ears, but what they need to hear. And then he gives his last words. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation. You ever, I don't know if it's a common thing, when you're gathered with friends and you pour out a drink for someone, you pour out a beer for the person who can't be there. It's an ancient practice, right? I've been at funerals where they pour one into the, the grave for, for the person and everyone takes shots. I was actually at a funeral where they had me be the bartender. So I poured shots for everyone. We poured one into the grave for the person buried and we all took shots together. That, that's what this is, right? I am being poured out as a libation. Right? That, that's the, this image. I, it's, I'm being poured out. My time is done. Drink one for me. Drink one for Paul. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. So do your best to come to me soon. Do your best to come before winter. The Lord be with you. And that's it. Like, we don't know if Timothy got to Paul. It, he probably didn't, actually. Right? So these are the last words from Paul to Timothy. And these last words, this last charge to go and preach. Like, this is the, the passing of the mantle. In the Old Testament, there's a point where Elijah takes his mantle, like a modern-day stole, and, and puts, puts it on Elijah, who then becomes the next prophet. Like, th this is the passing of the torch. And, and so... And then Paul says, my race is done. I'm, I'm, I'm dying, right? And so the, this term I told you about at the beginning, the court prophet, it's not once used in this letter, but it's what they both know. It's bo they both know that God's people can go off the rails. As Paul puts it, people will seek out uh, what they want to hear, what tickles their itching ears. And, and so Paul is encouraging Timothy to preach the gospel. Do not teach... Do not tell people what they want to hear always, because what they want to hear is we're doing great. Tell people what they need to hear. And being rooted in grace, here is what you can tell them. You can tell them the worst news they will ever know, that we are sinners. And then you can tell them the best news they will ever hear, that we are forgiven. But you got to tell them both. You can't have one without the other. Forgiveness doesn't mean anything unless there's something to forgive. So first, you've got to be able to tell people we are sinners and we can't do anything about that. And then you can tell them they are forgiven. Don't be a court prophet. Tell them what they need to know so that they, you can then tell them what is the wonderful news they can hear today. I believe this is still true today, this charge that Paul gives Timothy to be willing to speak the truth and to tell people what they need to know so that they can then hear the good news. And I think this is true. It, the way that the church grew, it, it's not that Paul, there was Paul who started these churches and then there was another Paul and another Paul and another Paul. The way the church grew in the first centuries was Paul started these churches and then individual people in the churches were able to go out and tell people this very simple truth throughout their lives. Tell them the truth, we are sinners, and then tell them the good news, you're forgiven. And I'll give you an example of it that happened to me a bit ago. I was talking to, to a friend who had told me something they had done that was horrible. Um, it, it was uh, involved adultery, right? And this person told me, I made a bad mistake. And I stopped and I told this person, no, you didn't make a bad mistake. You sinned against your family. I mean, that's about as like, that's as hard as you can say, right? But that's what it is. You have sinned against your family. 
But I also need you to know that you are forgiven and you are always welcome at my table because Jesus loves me. Like, I didn't plan for that to happen. That was not like on my list of things to do. But that's what is part of being Christian, is being willing to tell people. When it comes down to it, tell, being able to say, this is the worst thing I can tell you. We've sinned. And I can tell you the best thing you'll ever hear, though. You're always welcome at that table. There is nothing that you can do that will ever make it so you are not welcome there. Ever. Amen. Okay.